Father, we cannot thank you enough. But that won't stop us from trying. Because you've been so good, Father. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And thank you for being good even when we didn't deserve it, God. You've still been good. And God, we thank you more than anything else for your word. It's power, God, helps change our life. And it always points us in the right direction. So now, God, according to your authority and your power, do what you want the way you want it done. And let what you want said, God, impact us so much that when we leave here, we are never the same again. Thank you in advance. Let nothing interfere with us hearing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, if y'all thankful in this place, would you help me to celebrate the Lord on today? And one more time, help me praise God for our worship arts ministry, this choir. So grateful for that on today. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Let me say thank you. Um, you know, I, I had almost, uh, I forgot that tomorrow is 32 years uh, of preaching. And uh, tomorrow is the day I preach my very first sermon on the campus of Morehouse College in Sail Hall Chapel. Just for your info, there are no tapes, <laughs> there are no videos, nothing. Uh, but I'm grateful for progress. And when I said yes, I meant it. And I'm grateful for every single day. I wouldn't want to be anything else than a messenger of God's goodness. I wouldn't want to be anything else but a preacher. And uh, I thank God for the great privilege he's afforded me. In fact, we're going to talk about that today, about gratitude. We continue our sermon series, Give Thanks. And so we're grateful for Dr. Keem, who led us on last week. And now this week, we'll jump into this third installment in this fourth chapter of Philippians. Read the whole book when you get a chance. It's, it's short. It's just four chapters. And uh, it helps to make all of this come together. And that's why I want to point you to just a few verses, beginning at verse 10, and reading to you from the New International Version. Here's how the Word of God is recorded. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Now, indeed, you, you were concerned, I don't doubt that, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I ain't saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. <laughs> in fact, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether I was well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. And this is the word of God. Let the people of God say thanks be to God. I want to preach to you just a few moments this morning from the thought, I'm full. <laughs> Would y'all help me preach that? Turn to your neighbor, look him right in the eye, and tell him, I'm so full. Amen. Look back at him. Tell him, you ain't the only one. I am too. And it ain't even Thanksgiving. I'm, I'm full. Sean Acker, who's a Harvard psychologist, suggested we can actually train our brains to become more grateful by, grateful by practicing gratitude. He, in fact, cites a one-week study in which people were asked to just take five minutes a day to write down three things that they were thankful for. They didn't have to be big things, but they did have to be specific things. At the end of the month, the researchers went back, and what they found was that those who practiced gratitude for those three days were happier and less depressed. 
They came back after three months and they found still that those people who practiced that one thing were now still more joyful and content. Incredibly, after six months, the same people who did this for just one week were still happier, less anxious, and less depressed. Researchers came to the conclusion that just a simple practice of writing down what you're thankful for can help prime the mind to search for the good in your life. You know, I really think that we could tear a page from that particular study and use it in our own lives, our spiritual lives more importantly. Because I'm confident that if we take time to start being thankful to God for all that he's done, what we're going to end up discovering is we really do have plenty. And I'm not just talking about in a material capacity. I'm talking about in a spiritual capacity. And I know that oftentimes we toss this around as church lingo, but it really is the truth. If you consider all God has done for you, at some point you're going to have to say, I'm blessed and highly favored in the Lord. I expressing gratitude, y'all, daily is not that hard, except when we run into that entitlement mentality. <laughs> you know, it's that idea that you deserve everything you got and more. And I ain't saying you ain't grind a little bit for what you got. You did. Ambition is wonderful. But everything you got is not because of who you are. It's because we serve a beneficent God who is better to us than we've been to ourselves and has been good even when we were some timey with him. And because of his faithfulness, he keeps on doing great things. When we talk about gratitude, gratitude actually y'all flows from God to us and then out to others, and then back to God. And that's because, in the end, God is the source of our gratefulness. That's kind of why Paul is actually writing this particular letter to the church at Philippi. He's trying to tell them, thank you for supporting him in ministry. Where he's gotten is because they have always supported him and helped to meet his needs. And Paul is just following up with the idea that whenever anybody does something for you, especially when they didn't have to do it, the least you could do is say, thank you. When they got this particular letter, they immediately knew this wasn't some contrived letter. This wasn't no sample letter that was a part of some slide of hand trick because he was going to come back in a few days and ask them to sow a bigger seed in his ministry. They knew that this was the sincerity of Paul. How did they know? Because this is the church who had watched him go through some stuff and still be grateful. This is the church in Acts chapter 16 who had seen Paul trying to tell the good news of the gospel only to be thrown into jail. Here he was beaten, but even though he was in jail, had been beaten, they went home trying to go to sleep, and around midnight, he woke up everybody in the town with him and Silas holding a midnight worship service. God even got happy and the angels started dancing so much that the whole world started to give an earthquake and everybody in the jail was set free. Let me pause there and say that some of us need to understand that your worship isn't just for you. It will help set some folk free connected to you. And with all he had been through, they were confident that Paul's worship was for real. Have y'all ever gone to visit somebody to encourage them and then walked away and found out they were the ones who encouraged you? <laughs> that, that's kind of what's happening here in this particular text. The church at Philippi, y'all, is 100 miles east of Thessalonica. It's in northern Greece. It's just south of Bulgaria. And these people had been suffering for their faith, but they kept on going. And so now Paul is writing to this marginalized community because he's trying to tell them, y'all keep the faith because you got the victory in Jesus. Now, you know what? If anybody knew that to be true, it was this church. 
Can I tell you all why? This is the same church that was actually founded at a women's prayer meeting. In Acts chapter 16, verse 13, here were some women who couldn't get in the synagogue because they weren't men. So instead of them going home, they said, y'all, let's go down by the river and we'll hold a prayer service down there. And then Paul happened to pass by. So they got to talking about the goodness of the Lord. And somebody said, why don't we start a church? And so they organized a church right there. And here are some women who, despite the patriarchal systems of oppression at the time, made up their mind, y'all ain't going to stop us from serving God because our allegiance is to God and not to man. And Paul is writing to tell these sisters, thank y'all that when I was in prison, y'all were the ones who never forgot about me. Y'all were the ones who kept taking care of me with everything I had to go through. Can I pause right here and tell y'all this is the place where we need to learn how to every now and then thank God for the women? <laughs> we need to learn how to thank God for the women in the church. I know we got some churches not here that got these velvet ropes around the pulpit and can't nobody go up there unless they a man. You can clean up all around it. Just don't go up in there. Not here, baby. Because we already know that the first evangelist was a woman anyways who went and told the disciples he's not there anymore. He's risen. That's why y'all got to learn how to thank God for the Jorina Leeds who were the first ones to tell people about the goodness of God. Y'all got to learn how to thank God for all the Jerina Lees, all the Harriet Tubmans who were willing to say, I ain't going to just talk about him. I'm going to do something about it, even if I got to go through some dark situations. Thank God for the Sojourner Truths who say, I ain't afraid of none of y'all. Come on here. And they were willing to do what God wanted them to do. Thank God for the Betsy Stocktons who said, hey, maybe ain't nobody else going to sign up for this school, but I'll go in there and be the first one. Thank God for the Coretta Scott Kings who said, I'll be the one who's silently over here supporting him. He might be the one preaching, but baby, I'm the one holding him up. Thank God for the Phyllis Wheatleys who knew how to write their way through some stuff and encourage. Thank God for the Mahalia Jacksons in the church who could sing folk through their blues and their struggles. Thank God for the Clara Brown, for the Prathia Hall winds, for the Vashti McKenzie, Cynthia Hale, Gina Stewart, and so many others. And if you don't know none of them, you ought to at least thank God for your mama and your grandmama and your auntie and them who were the ones who were helping to keep stuff together in the church while everybody else was getting the credit. Thank God. Hallelujah. There you go. If it wasn't for the women, where would we be? Hallelujah. Beloved, the reality is all of us have something to be thankful for. And you got to be careful not to relegate your thanksgiving to stuff. Cash, cars, and clothes, that's all good. But you got to draw from a deeper source in your life. Stuff can be here one minute and gone the next. And when we learn to take our focus off of that and put it on him, we'll find out that God gives us joy, unspeakable joy, down in our hearts. Now I hear you. That's real good. Appreciate the little introduction, brother preacher. But what do we have to be thankful for? Now I'm not trying to get none of nobody's business, but let, but let me point out just a couple things. Uh, n number one, you can start with the lessons you've learned in your circumstances. <laughs> Let's get ready to get good. All of us have had some unfavorable circumstances in our life. And if you haven't, keep living. It's coming sooner or later. That's why Paul starts pinning right here, he says, now I ain't saying this because I'm in need, because I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. Yeah. Beloved, the University of Life 
will enroll you in classes you never signed up for. And I want you to know that the curriculum includes the hard lessons of adversity in your life. Adversity will teach you that tough times don't last always. Into everybody's life, some rain must fall. But sooner or later, the sun will shine again. But along the way, don't get stingy with your praise. I know you can praise him when everything is good. I know you can praise him when you just got the check. I know you can praise him when you got the good report. But you better learn how to praise him even when the lights go out. You got to learn how to praise him when you ain't got two nickels to rub together. You got to learn how to praise him even when you're having a tough time personally. Because his praise belongs to him. Learn how to be grateful regardless of whatever you're going through. And you may not have everything you want, but if you look around, you really do have everything you need. Many of us today have what we have because God has been so good to us in spite of our adversity. Um, can I tell y'all that, um, that there are generational differences in the way some folk handle adversity? <laughs> now, I, I got to be careful because I'm not trying... Um, to, to throw no shade on nobody. Uh, but but uh, for our generation, um, we, 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 we didn't have no problem with not having Wi-Fi. That, that, that didn't bother us because all we needed was two sticks and a rubber band and a few rocks and we had a party all day long and, and even if we didn't have that don't worry we knew how to make some stuff out of the mud and we didn't want to be in the house no way we wanted to be outside <laughs> that there are generational differences in dealing with adversity like like for instance um f for my generation and those came before me um we didn't get upset because we couldn't door dash mcdonald's to the house <laughs> no, baby, as long as we had a bowl of cereal and some oatmeal, we were good. And we didn't even need no milk. Even if we ain't got no milk, we got some water. And that was plenty to satisfy this hunger we had. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, and you know what? We, we also, I like this, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't get upset because uh, our parents wouldn't give us a ride across town uh, to see somebody. <laughs> if y'all had a mama like mine, she said, I ain't taking you nowhere. I done got to just work all day. I come home. I ain't, I ain't supposed to go back out there and speak. You better call Pat and Turner. Y'all know who Pat and Turner is? You, you better pat them feet and turn them corners and keep on walking. Keep it moving, baby. <laughs> yeah, God. Ad adversity. Adversity teaches you to be grateful for what you do have. And Paul is saying, y'all, that even when things are difficult, I've learned how to look around and thank God for what I do have. If, if you're having trouble uh, making up your mind what to be thankful by God, let me encourage you with just a couple of things. I got a list I brought for you tonight, uh, this afternoon. Uh, for instance, you all thank God that last night you had a bed to sleep in. Oh. I mean, even if you had to share it, at least you had somewhere to lay your head. And, and then when you looked up, you wasn't looking at the sky and the stars. You had a roof over your head. That, that's enough to thank God for, ain't it? And, and when you woke up this morning, the old deacon said, thank God that your bed wasn't your cooling board. And thank God that you had food on the table and clothes on your back. Beloved, you all thank God for the people in your life. Thank God for the people who love you enough to tell you the truth when you're wrong. Thank God for the folk who will love you regardless. And you ought to thank God for the friends you got. I'm talking about the real friends now. I'm talking about them friends that you can call at 3 in the morning and say, I need you to come go with me. And they ain't asking no questions. All they're going to tell you is meet me outside. And they're the ones who will ride or die. You ought to thank God for them kind of folk in your life. You ought, you ought to thank God for the folk who love you. And you need to thank God for the folk who don't like you. Because you need them. That way you can be sure that when God throws your victory party, you at least know they're going to be there. And 
God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies and won't even tell the DJ to get the party started until they show up. Hallelujah. Thank God for him. He's done so much. I just can't tell it all. I'm full, y'all. I really am. You ought to be grateful for the lessons learned in your circumstances, but also you ought to be grateful for the ability to be content with what you have. <laughs> you're, you're using my sanctified imagination. I've been reading this all week, and I'm, I'm sure that this is the part when Paul was writing, this is where he got happy. Paul is writing this thing, and then he says, you know what? I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. Beloved, when you've been on both sides of that particular fence of having plenty and being in need, then this is the place where you start to realize money don't move you. I mean, I'm good with it. But it don't move me. And it's cool to have something to be able to splurge every now and then and to take trips to exotic places. That's wonderful. But if you've had it and you lost it and sometimes repeated that cycle again, then you learn just to be grateful that with everything you've been through, I can testify at least I'm still here. And you become less stressed about trying to keep up with other folk and you're thankful for what you do have. <laughs> you got to be thankful. I was thinking about it this week. And you be thankful how God has provided and stretched some stuff. <laughs> um, if you're over 40, 35, I, I, I said this earlier. I'm, I'm probably going to go in this service to 30, okay? If you're over 30, then you know what it is to have a little and it still be enough. <laughs> Can I prove it to you? Um, we came up in the generation where you didn't just throw stuff away. No, you didn't. Uh-uh. You learned how to stretch your little to make a lot. I I'll prove it to you. All of y'all in here, over 30, some of y'all under it. No, you had a can on your stove. And you ain't touched that can. It, it was filled with grease that turned white after it cooled. <laughs> and that's because after you cooked, you didn't throw that grease away. Uh -uh, Mama said, put that in that can so we can use it later on. That, that, that's why some of our fish and chicken tasted like bacon. Mama say that's just good seasoning, baby. <laughs> we can make a little stretch. Got another one for you. Back in the day, we didn't have scrunchies. We didn't have that liquid soap. We had bars of soap. And, and when you got down to that thin piece of salt that was cracking in the middle, what you do with it? Grandmama and mama had a little bowl over on the side of that tub and you put them little pieces in there. Don't throw them away, put them in there. At the appropriate time, you can put them things together and you got a whole nother bar of soap. I meant it like I said, a whole nother bar of soap. <laughs> got another one for you. But, but back in the day, when, when you got down to that last little bit of ketchup, and that thing started splattering when you squeeze it and not pouring, you ain't throw that away. What you do with it? You, you put that thing under the faucet. You ain't using the Mozarka bottle water. You put it under the faucet, get a little water in that thing. You take a butter knife, then you take that butter knife, dip it in there, mix that thing up. You got a whole nother bottle of ketchup right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Got one more for you. Uh, 
when you got to the part where that toothpaste was just a little bit pushing out. <laughs> you ain't throw that thing away and then go grab a, another tube of paste. No! You take a screwdriver or the handle of a butter knife and you roll that thing on the back until you get all of it up to the top. Then you push it out. That was good for at least three or four more brushes. Do I throw it away then? No, you don't throw it away after that. You get to the back, then you start rolling that thing up. Little by little, little by little, day by day, till you got back to the top and you still had another three or four brushes in there. I throw it away now that, no, you don't throw it away. Then you go over there and get granddaddy's razor and then you take the blade out of that thing and then you cut that thing right down the middle and then you fold that thing back and then you scrape out it, hallelujah. You scrape out it at a little bit of pace. And you got another three or four brushes left in there too. Hallelujah, take me back, take me back. Where it used to be, take me back. I'm grateful you are too. God keeps on making a way for you and a little bit can go a long way. I ain't got everything I want, but I got everything I need. I might not have steak, but at least I got something in my body. I may not be stretched out in the mansion, but at least I got a roof over my head. Thank God for the little things he keeps on doing. Hallelujah. And... <laughs> Glory to God. You get to the place where Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Y'all, I don't pretend to know a whole lot, but there are some things I do know. And this one thing I do know, that in life, people will change. Seasons will change. Circumstances will change. Feelings will change change but one thing that will never change and that is the God that we serve the Bible says he's the same yesterday today and forevermore and Paul is suggesting that whatever season you're in you got to learn how to look at that thing through the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ because no matter how much I got left, as long as I got Jesus, I got enough. Now I understand what Mama meant when she says, as long as I got King Jesus, I'm going to be all right. You got to have gratitude and you should be grateful for the lessons I'm done. You've learned in your circumstances. You ought to be grateful for the ability to be content with what you have. And the last thing is, you got to be grateful for the confidence you have in your supply. Paul said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So at 8 o'clock, this is where I, I know we want to shout right here. But I need you to understand the context of this verse so that we don't keep taking it out of context. Paul is trying to tell us that before you start trying to use this scripture for you to use it like a label that you slap on to the stuff that you want and then try and make God responsible for it, Paul says this simply means that whatever it is you face, Jesus Christ is the foundation. And whether you're in wealth or poverty, success or failure, joy or sorrow, Jesus is our strength. I need about a hundred of y'all in here who will help me co-sign on this thing and close this little message right here. Jesus is not our last resort. He is our starting point. Everything in this life <laughs> begins with the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> in Christ, <laughs> we have life and life more abundantly. In fact,
Paul says that in Christ is where we get the strength that we need. This is why you don't have to be discouraged when things go bad in your life. Times will get tough. But because the enemy comes against you, you ain't got to shrink back. The more grounded you are in Christ Jesus, the more confident you are that in every situation, he's an all-time God. And we can do nothing but in him. We can do all. I need some folk who read about his strength is made perfect in our weakness and it doesn't matter how big the challenges is he's a very present help in a time of need and no matter what the odds might be against you the bible says all things are possible to him that believeth that god gives us the victory through christ jesus our lord and it does not matter what situation as long as Jesus is on your side. Everything is going to work out in your favor. I hear y'all, y'all say we'll shout, but tell us one last thing, Pastor. Why is it that you say we are so full? Here it is. When you start to think about everything you've had to go through, all the trials and tribute. I need some folks who will think back with me just a little while and you remember that it was the Lord who provided everything you need. You'll come to your own conclusion. I don't need nobody in here to shout me happy. I came in here full of gratitude unto the Lord. <laughs> when I start to think back over my life <laughs> and consider the uncomfortable places I had to deal with. But I realized that even when other people walked out on me, the Lord never left me alone. I get up in the morning full of gratitude unto the Lord. I'm going to come for you. When you consider the battles you've had to face, and then you realize that the Lord has given you victory in every single one of them, every time he came against you God gave you the victory then you know for yourself I'm so full of gratitude I need about 200 of y'all in here one more time that when you think about everything you've been through but the Lord has brought you through all that you had to deal with you know that you're full of gratitude unto the Lord when you consider everything the enemy has thrown against you all of the troubles and trials all of the difficulty and pain all of the traps that he tried to set but every time he tried it God blocked it every time he sent his demon God blocked it every time he tried to discourage you God blocked it is there anybody in here who can testify God blocked it he tried to come for my family and God blocked it. He tried to come for my spirit, but God blocked it. He was almost on my job, but God blocked it. Tried to come up in my school, but God blocked it. Tried to take out my hope, but God blocked it. Every time he comes against me, I'm getting happy right here. God blocked it. I need somebody in here who can think back over your life and just testify God. God blocked it. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I can co-sign on that because he's thrown some stuff at me, but God blocked it. Come on, turn to your neighbor. You about to get it. Look at somebody and just say, God blocked it. Come on, look back at him. Say, he blocked it for me too. It almost got me, but God blocked it. It almost took me out, but God blocked it. So when I come up in this church, coming here to fool with nobody I ain't coming here to try and find nobody I ain't coming here to try and critique nobody I don't care what they wear I don't care if they're red bottoms or nobody I don't care if it's a three piece or a hoodie I came in here because I came to give God thanks 
for everything he's done. Thank you for making a way out of no way. Thank you for opening doors for me. Thank you for keeping my mind straight. Thank you for taking care of my mom. Thank you for taking care of my daddy. Thank you for making a way for us over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. Anybody can testify he keeps on doing great things. He keeps on doing great things. Then just take about 30 seconds and just start to think a little bit back over your life. And I promise you, the more you think, the more you thank him. Come on, go ahead. I'm going to give you a minute. to run back down the street you ain't always been in church remember how God brought you out of some stuff that almost had you remember when you were sick but the Lord healed your body you ain't always had everything you got Remember how God made a way for you and shall thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. thank him for all he's he's done for you and you'll be able to say for yourself I'm full of gratitude unto the Lord he's been better to me this for me y'all right here he's been better to me that I've been to myself. And he didn't have to do it. He probably shouldn't have done some of the stuff he did. But he did it anyway, didn't he? And that's why we say thank you. Thank you to a God who keeps on doing great things. And we come full of gratitude. Well, don't don't just, don't just stay in that emotional state. Make a decision that nothing else, I'm gonna be in right relationship with the Lord Jesus. And as we stand all over this place, maybe there's somebody here today who can say, I came in here uncertain, but I'm leaving out of here more committed than ever to my relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here and you've never accepted him today as your Savior today, I want to invite you just to say yes to the Lord, just to make a decision. I'm coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make certain that my eternity is secure. And all I got to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe you died, rose, and you're coming back just for me. If that's you today, come on, let's show everybody that you're leaving here better than you came. Maybe maybe you need a church home today. Y'all been talking about it, but you say, you know what, today's the day. Today's the day we're going to go ahead and make up our mind that we need to join this church. We want to be a part of your family, but the decision is yours. Come on, if you're here today, won't you come? Thank you.